Good afternoon, everyone. We're at the hour, so let's get started. Thank you for coming. So each year, towards the middle of the year, Puppet Labs does a survey that they call the State of DevOps. So they survey thousands of DevOps individuals. And what I find fascinating about what they publish from this is they categorize you know, uh, high-performing teams versus everybody else. And they publish several different metrics comparing these high-performing teams to others. And one that I always look for, and the survey has been going on for about six years now, is something that they call lead time. So in 2017, the report said that high-performing teams, IT teams, DevOps teams, I have 440 times faster lead times than others. And what that means is if you're going from a commit to a deploy, it's a difference between doing it in an hour to taking a week to do that single deploy. And that's just on average, right? We all know we've all been in software teams where things take a lot longer. So today we're going to talk about a technology which I believe has the ability to kind of you know, democratize this for everyone, right? We're going to talk specifically about, a lot about Kubernetes. Um, I'm going to introduce the basics of what Kubernetes is. I'm going to talk about it from an ops perspective and then also from a dev perspective. And then we'll see how we can get started, you know, and I'll demo using Nirmata, uh, which is the company that I'm with. So just a quick introduction to who I am. I'm the founder and CEO at Nirmata. Uh, I've been a software developer for about 20 or so years now. And, uh, have always been working with uh, distributed systems, starting with telephony, networking, and now moving on to application management. Which, and it's an interesting transition because the, the type of complexity we saw in device management and networks now has sort of manifested in applications because of things like microservices and containers, all the moving pieces that we see at that layer of the stack now. All right, so let's dig into it. I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to go fairly quickly. Feel free to interrupt if there's questions. But I may, you know, kind of, if, depending on time, we may just take questions at the end. So let's start with just a quick introduction to what Kubernetes is and why it matters to all of us, right? So just from a definition perspective, and if you go to the Kubernetes website, this is what they say there. It's an open source system. Uh, to, be a, to manage, orchestrate, containerized applications. And we'll see why, why each one of these aspects is important and what the, it has meant for the industry itself. A little bit about the history of Kubernetes. First off, the word itself, if you're wondering what it means, it means helmsman or somebody who's guiding or navigating. Uh, it's a Greek word. It's pronounced differently in, uh, in uh, some of my Greek friends have told me, and I've also read about this, it's pronounced differently, but I can't uh, say it that way, so it's Kubernetes uh, as far as uh, you know, we're concerned. Uh, but this came out of a lot of development, a lot of um, you know, lessons learned at Google, um, because it's interesting that as Docker, the container engine became popular, and as you know, more and more people were adopting containers, Google said that, look, we've been running everything you use, every software that you use that Google develops, has been containerized and we've been running containers for the last 10 years. In fact, it was Google that contributed a lot of the underpinnings of what we know of as containers today, including things like namespaces, C groups, et cetera, all of these which are Linux features itself. So at Google initially developed Kubernetes from some of the lessons learned from internal orchestration systems like Borg and Omega. They then open sourced and you know, released this to CNCF CNCF being the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So it's part of the Linux Foundation. It's a subgroup. Uh, and their charter is to govern technologies which promote cloud native computing, right? Um, and it, there's, a, there's a very vibrant and strong community, including Nirmata, my company. We're part of the CNCF. We contribute in terms of source, in terms of discussions, the curation and the guidance of not just Kubernetes, but a lot of surrounding projects like Prometheus and others as well. And it's amazing, you know, and this is something um, from a business perspective, we're fairly conservative in the choices we make. Um, so as Kubernetes matured and developed, it's just amazing to see how powerful and how many constructs are in there and how it's quickly outpaced anything else in the field, right? So just a few years ago, uh, it was, you know, uh, either Mesos or Swarm or even Kubernetes were 
the, some uh, considered the top three orchestration solutions, but now by far in terms of number of features and the maturity of the, you know, what's available itself, Kubernetes has outpaced the others uh, quite dramatically. So one thing to remember, and this is, Joe Bida is one of the original authors of Kubernetes, now with a company called Heptio that does consulting services and some products around Kubernetes. His, you know, and this was on his Twitter feed, which, uh, you know, I really like this quote where, and it resonates as you learn about Kubernetes, because it's really not a solution or a product that's not intended to be used as an product, but it's a toolbox. It can do a lot of things, and there are large enterprises like the, you know, like, like the Googles of the world who will take those tools and build their own opinionated solutions which are ideal for their business with those set of tools. But if you're looking at it for mass consumption, for other things, there's a lot of things needed around Kubernetes to be able to start operationalizing it and utilize it correctly, and we'll talk about some of those. So just diving right in and going into what exactly are the various components and what are the pieces of the architecture itself, right? So in Kubernetes, there are two main roles when it comes to machine types, um, masters and workers. The masters are where you run what's known as the master components, and we'll cover some uh, of these in detail. And the workers are where your applications run, along with some other Kubernetes components as well. You can also have things like add-ons which are doing monitoring, maybe log aggregation, things like that, which you would typically deploy in your cluster. And that, that kind of you know, is most of the software you want to deploy. But then Kubernetes has to run somewhere. So, and to run on infrastructure, there's always a need to integrate well with the infrastructure. So that's where some of the cloud provider integrations come in. And that's an important piece if you're deploying, operating, or even bringing up Kubernetes on a cloud yourself, um, you need to kind of figure out the cloud provider integrations if you want to leverage the networking, the compute storage that the cloud provider uh, delivers, right? Um, there are overlay solutions for almost all of these, uh, but as with anything overlay, there's some complexities and overhead uh, that comes with those. Okay, so one other thing I want to cover, you know, which is very basic in Kubernetes. Um, uh, so it's interesting when you read through the documentation, when you look at the literature, there's very little mention of containers. And you, know, you might wonder, why is that? But instead, they talk a lot about something called pods. And at first, you know, like even as I approached Kubernetes, um, it was a little bit puzzling. It's like, why aren't they giving containers the same prominence that everybody else in the industry does? But the more you, you know, look at the concepts around it, you realize that most applications may not be just a single container but you have a set of cohesive modules. Much like in a, in a program, you, if you're writing object-oriented code, you have a set of cohesive objects that need to work together to deliver a function. Similarly, a pod, you can think of it as a set of uh, containers which are tightly coupled, have the same identity, the same lifecycle, the same networking, the same storage, but they work together to deliver some function in your application, right? Now, pods can be stateless or can be stateful, and we'll talk about some of those. But the important thing to remember here is that's the unit of delivery, the unit of management in Kubernetes, not a container, but a pod. And in this example, they've shown, let's say if you're writing a simple web service, which is you know, kind of uh, serving up some pages, could be static co content, you might, in that same pod, have another container that's responsible for loading that from an external source, right? So that's a great example of these two containers working together to deliver one function, one service, um, in a potentially stateless manner uh, in the setup. The other interesting thing you could do with, you know, and folks like Google, um, you know, they never used VMs or hypervisors internally. And the interesting thing there is a pod sort of mimics what you can do with the VM. Right, because now you end up with the same um, you know, networking, the same, uh, every container in the pod sees the same network, sees the same storage. And you could even do things like IPC communication, which you can't uh, 
if you were just running containers on a host, right? And that's a uh, pretty tough problem with uh, just Docker containers uh, where you run into some of those issues and Kubernetes solves that in a nice and elegant fashion. All right, so having covered those two basic concepts, we talked about master components, worker components. Uh, we talked about what pods are. Let's dive in a little deeper into how a cluster is built, what makes up a cluster itself, right? So on the master nodes, um, there are several pieces of software, services that need to run. Now these can run in containers, and in fact in the demo I'll show when we deploy a cluster through Nirmata, we believe that containers are the best way to run any application, so we run Kubernetes completely containerized, um, and it makes it easy to upgrade, manage, et cetera, too. So all of these, the API server being the front end where everything else in your cluster communicates through the API server, and keep in mind, each one of these can scale out, right? So you can have several instances of this in a production cluster or a single instance, and in fact, if you're running Kubernetes as Minikube on your laptop, you'll just have one instance of all of this. Um, you can also, you, so now Kubernetes has this, this API server function, but it needs to store state and persist state somewhere, right? So this is all your configuration for how you want your cluster to behave, uh, which deployments, which pods you have running, et cetera. And that's done by default in etcd. Everything in Kubernetes is fairly pluggable, but by default, and you know, the simplest key value store you can use is something called etcd. Um, and again, this can run as in a replicated mode. It could be external to the cluster, but it's very common to just deploy it as part of your cluster itself. The other functions in Kubernetes, they all follow a particular pattern. So everything, you know, everything Kubernetes does is almost like a control loop. And if you're familiar with like, you know, like hardware or type programming, basically you have a control loop where um, you have you know, something that's watching for events or state. And when that happens, it's reacting to it. And then it keeps looking for those particular set of events over and over again. Similarly, in Kubernetes, there's about 14 different controllers, which are packaged into a single container called the controller manager. There's another set of controllers for the cloud provider integration. Remember, we talked about how if you want to leverage the cloud providers, infrastructure, networking, et cetera. So there's a set of controllers for that. And then there's a scheduler, which is also a controller, but its function, its only purpose in life is to place pods on nodes, right? So these set of controllers are what really make up the bulk of the business logic, if you will, for Kubernetes itself, uh, and they all run on the master nodes. Now you can, you can, and there it's everything again in Kubernetes is extremely configurable. You can run your workloads on the master nodes, but in a typical production installation, you're gonna want to separate out this, the control plane software from your workloads uh, just because you can scale and manage them differently. And you can also choose different machine types and things like that, right? So it makes it more flexible. All right, so that's, those are the things that run on the master node, but there's also components that have to run on the worker nodes. So the first thing that runs on every worker node is something called a kubelet. And that, think of it as an agent which runs on every worker node, connects back to the API server, and gets instructions from the master node components on what to do next. So it's just sitting there waiting to say, okay, what do I do? Uh, and it could be as simple as, okay, run a container, run a pod, get logs, open a console, things like that. Um, there's also a networking component, which is responsible for local as well as you know, cross-node networking, something called Coop proxy, uh, and that runs on every node, right? And interestingly, in Kubernetes, DNS is an add-on, but you are almost like 99% gonna be running DNS, so you, you, it's, you can think of it almost as a required component, and most installations will do this by default. But DNS comes in, into, in as an add-on, and add-ons are just optional components that you can choose to run on one or more of your nodes. Um, you also need, of course, on every worker node, you need a container engine. So the most popular one being Docker, of course, a Docker engine itself, which you can use to spin up, spin down, manage containers on the worker node. Uh, but there are other emerging engines, like there's, um, you know, like with Rocket or even ContainerD and others, which you can use as alternate engines, if you will, 
uh, to run your Kubernetes workloads. I mentioned that there is this concept of add-ons. So the two most popular are there's a dashboard which gives you visibility into your cluster and some you know, management capabilities of your cluster. And then there's the DNS uh, that we talked about, which you are, if you want to do service discovery, if you want to look up you know, information across your components, you are very likely going to need DNS. And then finally, there's the application pods, so your containers itself too. Yeah. So Docker needs to be installed on every uh, worker node? That's right. So you need some container engine, and one of the things that's happening in the community is even Docker engine is now separated into the Docker API components and then the container D uh, portion itself. Container D has been kind of become part of um, you know, CNCF. There's also something called CRIIO, which is a Kubernetes specific you know, adapter to container engines. And there are you know, folks like Red Hat and others writing very purpose built container engines around that interface. So it is more and more becoming you know, possible to run without having a full fledged Docker engine, because Docker engine comes with a lot of other things which Kubernetes also doesn't need. Uh, but most, in most cases today, you will run you know, Docker because that's uh, fairly popular, mature, and stable. Yes? So it could be both. It depends on your use case. Like for so something like DNS, you would run it you know, on the worker. Dashboard, too, most likely on the worker. But some add-ons like DNS, you might want to run as a daemon set. And I'll cover what that is. It basically is components which run on every node. Others, you might just want to run a single instance. right? All right, so let's talk quickly about networking and storage in Kubernetes, and then we'll go more into the workload side of things itself. So in Kubernetes, uh, the approach to networking is very different than what Docker did, Docker Inc., the company did for their networking. So there were three, three rules that kind of uh, you know, describe the philosophy, if you will, of Kubernetes networking. The first is that every pod should be able to communicate to any other pod, and pod being you know, your application components, without having to go through something like NAT. right? So there should be no translation, no bridge in between for that communication. The second is that from your host, from your nodes, you should also be able to communicate uh, to any other pod or container uh, without doing any translation. right? So Think about if you are familiar with Docker networking, these two complete are very different, because as soon as you install Docker, you get a bridge network on that host. You go through some translation right off the bat. right? That's the default. Here, the philosophy was, no, we want to kind of keep things very flat uh, in terms of the networking. And lastly, one other important ground rule was that the IP that the container sees, if you're running some code inside of a container in a pod, the IP that you see in your application code is the same that somebody outside sees as your IP address also. And at first, again, these seem like, okay, these are strange things to impose upon a networking you know, um, kind of decision. But as you get familiar with running workloads in Kubernetes and as you look at different types of applications, this dramatically simplifies how you can manage microservices style applications and there's a lot of value to it. Now, so basically think of it as it's flat networking, right? And everybody, uh, and it could be an overlay that you're running to achieve this, uh, but each pod is getting its own IP address. And you know, there, are, there are several plugins, several different ways to get that pod, that IP address. CNI is the standard, uh, the container network interface is a standard if you, you know, want to write your own plugin and get your own IP addresses. You can, you have to kind of uh, write uh, to the CNI spec. And Kubernetes uh, workers will automatically detect the plugins and load them. Yes? These are all uh, private addresses? It can be, or it could be external addresses too. So there are, you know, there are converged like sort of hardware manufacturers like Diamante in the Kubernetes space. Um, they will just you know, route your services directly to upstream uh, in an upstream address pool. So when you configure a cluster, you just give it a segment of addresses for your pods. And if these are routable outside, that's fine. 
So as long as you, you kind of follow those three rules uh, and you're choosing a network plugin, and Cisco has a network plugin, Contive, which also does this, right? So you could get private addresses or you could get you know, used routable addresses uh, from an external space. Okay, so just some quick uh, words on storage, and because this is obviously a big area for any application, and it's interesting that when containers first, you know, started gaining popularity, there's a lot of fud around, you know, well, containers are only good for stateless apps. I can't run a traditional app in a container, and it's absolutely not true. You can run anything you want in a container. It is a little bit more complex to manage the storage uh, if your application happens to be stateful, right? So with Kubernetes, there are some very well-defined constructs. Each pod can have one or more volumes. Volumes can be things like local disk, which are just you know, temporary storage. Uh, they could be host you know, mount uh, file systems. So you could bring NFS to your host and then mount that into a container. Or you can have shared you know, block storage devices, right? And there's several, there's like literally more than a couple of dozen different types of volume plugins. And initially, all of these plugins had to be compiled in into the Kubernetes source. So what happened is then you know, uh, the, there was a, another plugin type introduced called Flex Volume, which externalizes this. And now it's very much easier to write a volume plugin and map that dynamically into a running Kubernetes uh, system using something just like in networking, there was CNI. For storage, there's CSI. Um, container storage interface, not, not CSI Miami or one of those, but <laughs> um, so yeah, it's fairly possible and there's a whole set of different volume plugins you can leverage already. Another interesting concept in Kubernetes is something called a volume claim. So let's say you're, you're spinning up a pod and you don't really have a volume assigned to that pod yet, you can give it a ticket, like just like you would get a, like a lotto ticket or you know, if you're standing in line at a deli, you get a claim ticket. So you get a ticket with which you can claim a volume from a pool. And once you claim that volume, that volume is now associated to that pod. The, the claim and the volume are bound together, uh, but initially the volume may be dynamically provisioned. Right? So this gives a lot of flexibility. Your administrators can set up storage, something known as storage classes, each storage class can have a different provisioner defined with it. And now your pods can dynamically claim volumes. You can spin up and allocate storage and associate them to the pod. If that pod happens to move on a different host, as long as it has that same claim, it will get back the same volume. Right? So it, it's a nice way of solving some of the challenges with managing stateful applications in containers. More and more, you know, even with uh, like all of this, every clustered app is moving more towards uh, stateless nature and externalizing storage. So you kind of have to see whether your application really needs this or if it's possible to you know, not leverage uh, persistent volumes and just kind of uh, manage state somehow separately. All right, so so far we have covered like the basics of what it takes to do, you know, uh, to, to manage a container, some of the main concepts. But I wanna show you what this looks like in action. And I'm gonna do the demo with Nirmata. So first I'll just briefly introduce what Nirmata does and who we are, right? So our, like I said before, our view of the world is that containers are the best way to package applications and Kubernetes is the best way to deploy, operate, manage applications, right? So what we do around Kubernetes, first off, as we just saw, Kubernetes itself is a distributed application and it needs to run as infrastructure somewhere so we can deploy, operate, manage Kubernetes on you know, everything from bare metal to any cloud provider uh, through a distributed system that, you know, through Nirmata itself. Secondly, Kubernetes needs um, machines to run on and Nirmata can help provision, deploy, and manage these machines dynamically. Because what you really want is you want your clusters to be elastic and you don't want these to be statically sized and manually maintained because then you're losing a lot of benefits that Kubernetes and other cloud providers and other things provide, right? So this elastic cluster nature based on workloads, based on other triggers, uh, Nirmata integrates with every major cloud provider and provides that out of the box too. But most importantly, what we do is, you know, our, our main customer is IT ops, right? So it's, 
DevOps teams, it's operations teams who are responsible for deploying, operating these clusters and providing them as a service within their business itself. And what we do is we, we have policies, governance, visibility, management for them, as well as the integration that CICD uh, tools require to be able to deploy, operate workloads onto these clusters. Um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, in a nutshell, what we do. I also want to kind of touch on what it takes to deploy a cluster, right? So it, let's assume we're setting up a cluster from scratch, you know, and what are the things we would want to do if we, assuming it's a production cluster, uh, which we want to uh, sort of give to our business. So the first thing you're going to need, of course, is some infrastructure services, compute network storage, you know, the basics that you would want. Then you're going to want to install everything we talked about for the master node components, and each one of these has integrations, so there's several choices to be made for networking, et cetera, right? Um, and you need to configure your worker node components as well. On top of that, you want your business units, your lines of businesses to run their applications, but you want to make sure that, you know, it's very easy, even in something like Kubernetes, with all of the benefits it provides, to end up writing applications in a manifest in a manner where they're locked in into a single cloud provider. So how do you make sure that when something goes to production, it has the right policies, it's written in a you know, agnostic and portable fashion, things like that. So we have a policy engine which helps you know, with that application manifest and, and the workloads itself, right? And we'll show that in more detail later. But then finally, once you've deployed your workloads, these are, keep in mind, uh, this with continuous delivery, with CI, CD integrations, applications and workloads are constantly changing. So you need some sort of change management components. Of course, you also need to monitor all of this and report on everything. Uh, so you're gonna need monitoring across your stack. You're gonna want centralized logging for your applications uh, because with distributed systems, if you have to go to each console or each pod to see the logs, it's just too tedious. You need some way of load balancing you know, traffic into your cluster, right? So that's what an ingress does. And then you're gonna have to think about security across the stack, including a lot of functions like isolation, resource controls, admission controls, things of that nature. So what we do at Nirmata is the darker blue boxes are what we cover, and then we integrate with tools in our ecosystem for all of the remaining functions, right? So the goal is to make it very simple, very straightforward, and that's what I'll show, to be able to deploy and operate these clusters. So let's, let's actually deploy a Kubernetes cluster, and I'm gonna go to my Nirmata console. Okay, so here I'm logged in. So Nirmata has several different delivery mechanisms. Uh, we are, you can consume us as a SaaS, or we're a cloud service, or we also have an on-premises or a managed service offering. But here I'm in my SaaS account, so you see I'm logged in over here, and I'm looking at some of the activity, just a dashboard of what's going on here. Going to the cloud provider section, and like I mentioned, we can do everything from direct connect to uh, other major cloud providers. What I did right before the demo is I provisioned an AWS, uh, what we call a host group. So this is just a group of machines, of VMs. And no, if, you, if I drill down into it, I see that they're running a few Nirmata containers, but nothing else, right? And what I wanna do for this first demo is I'm gonna create a brand new cluster onto these, um, into that host group that we just saw. So I'm gonna call this DevNet Create, and I'm gonna select the host group AWS demo, which is running in my AWS VPC um, at the moment, right? And all of these other things are optional. I mean, you can, like we talked about to your question, you can configure address blocks over here if I want a you know, particular address range for my uh, cluster or for my endpoints, uh, but we'll just leave it as defaults and say create cluster. So at this point, what's happened is because we have Nirmata agents running on those hosts, our control plane is telling those agents to go start launching Kubernetes and to bring that up on those hosts. And we'll see here if I go into the um, cluster that we deployed, in a few seconds what we should see is it kind of comes alive and it says that um, now we're ready to kind of start looking at uh, progress in our cluster, right? So if I go in, drill down into more details here, and I can see these are all, notice we talked about API server, controller manager, everything I described, the components I described is what's getting deployed live at the moment on those AWS hosts, right? 
And in a few seconds, we should see some of these should start turning green. And then the cluster will be up and ready for consumption, right? Yes, great question, right? So we don't, um, we're 100% open source provider. So we certify against every major release, like with 1.7.1.8.1.9. Here it picked 1.9 because the policy that I chose was specified with 1.9.1, right? But everything here is configurable by you. If you want to use like an upstream release, which is you know in beta, it's fine. We don't really try to curate a mandate or police what you're deploying. Yeah, so this, this, and, um, this policy, another thing to mention, it uses AWS. Because we deployed on AWS, it already knew to use AWS as a cloud provider. And the networking type chosen over here is going to be AWS's CNI plugin. So we're not doing like Vive or you know, even Contiv or anything else on top of AWS. Because AWS is already an overlay network, we want to leverage AWS you know, constructs if you're running on AWS. So if you go to the, your AWS console, you will see native networking and IP addresses allocated directly from AWS in this case. You can even set up your security groups, et cetera, to manage your traffic. And that's the beauty of an integration like this, right? If you just deploy an overlay, you kind of miss out on all of the tools your cloud provider is giving you. Similarly, if we were running on vSphere, same thing. We would you know, plug in into vSphere native constructs uh, or OpenStack or any cloud provider we choose. OK, so just going back to the cluster, and this one is almost up. We see that we have the main components up. I also see that Nirmata already picked up uh, on you know, like the namespaces that are by default. If I go into Coop system, I should see that most of this has come up. I can even, you know, one interesting thing we can do just to see where we are in the deployment. If I go into my cluster, I can launch a terminal, and this just opens a cloud shell directly into my cluster itself. So here I should be able to do kubectl, and we can see what nodes we have. I can even do Let's try to get the component status. Oops, did I spell that wrong? Oh, maybe it requires a get. Try it one more time in this manner. Yep. All right. So, ah, okay. <laughs> That's right. So we see everything is healthy now, right? So we have uh, etcd up, the controller manager up, and our scheduler up. And the last piece that comes up is the networking component. So all the workers have to get networked. And once that's done, if I go back in here. You know, in, so it's kind of transitioned from pending to deployed to not ready. And now, in a few seconds, we should see we'll go into a ready state. And really, that's all it would take for me to create a new cluster on any cloud provider based on policies that I've set up, right? Um, so we'll come back and look at Nirmata some more. But I want to go back to our slides and continue now with the workload side of things. for what we have to do, right? So all of this, the purpose of deploying Kubernetes, of managing Kubernetes, is to allow, enable containerized applications, right? So developers also need to interact with Kubernetes clusters. And first, when you approach Kubernetes, like I mentioned, you, know, you, you kind of wonder where um, you know, containers are. But the other thing, if you're looking at Kubernetes from a developer perspective, there's no real concept of an application. Remember what Joe Bida said that Kubernetes is a tool set? This is very true when you look at this diagram because there's so many constructs, but where's the app, right? And that's what we'll describe. And in fact, there's a committee now in Kubernetes that's starting to define a higher level 
application construct which ties together some of these lower level constructs, right? Um, but going back to a pod and using that as a fundamental unit, so if I'm a developer, I'm gonna care mostly about what goes in my pod, which containers, which container image, what port do I open, do I need a volume? All of those are things that developers would care deeply about, right? There are other constructs like you know, node selectors, if I want pods to run on a certain type of hardware, if I need affinity with other services, many, many things I could do. But the basics are choosing you know, your ports, choosing whether you need a volume, and your container image, like you know, what am I gonna start with, which OS, and how do I you know, uh, package my application in my container. You can deploy pods directly onto Kubernetes, right? So I could go to Kube Control and say run a pod, but that's not what you would wanna do because that requires a lot of manual watching and intervention and management. So the best way to manage pods is through one of these three constructs. You would either use deployments, you would use stateful sets, or you would use daemon sets. And there are others, there's, there's other tools like replica sets or jobs, but the main three that you wanna kind of uh, understand and learn are deployments, stateful sets, and daemon sets. So covering what deployments are, um, a deployment is a way which describes, think of it as a declarative set of rules for how you want to roll out, upgrade your application. And it will take care of the pods for you underneath. So actually it's a little bit more involved than that. A deployment creates replica sets and replica sets create and manage pods. But all what you get is a very easy way to specify upgrade policies. And then the deployment is constantly watching for changes in the state, changing in nodes, and it will self-correct your application as needed, right? So extremely powerful set of constructs, and this is where that control loop behavior I talked about comes into play, because uh, the controller is now, once you have defined a deployment, it will keep track of that for you and manage its state and lifecycle. Um, stateful sets are very similar to deployments, but they're meant for pods where you need stable identity. So if you have pods which require the same name regardless of where they get deployed, you wanna use something like stateful sets. If you have pods which require the same volumes, although you could do that with persistent volume claims yourself and deployments, stateful sets give you a lot of benefits for doing that because they have a volume claim template which further abstracts away the, the amount of management, right? So there's some applications where you wanna consider stateful sets. Finally, daemon sets are where you might want you know, a single pod, like we talked about DNS, you want that same application component, that same service to run on every node in your cluster. That's when you would use a daemon set uh, because it would deploy it, much like a daemon in a Linux system, every host gets an instance of it. And you can use a node selector if you want to further narrow down where this goes. Now, we, now that we know how to kind of you know, manage pods and deploy pods, upgrade pods, uh, the next question is how do I network my application, right? And we talked about some of this, but from the developer point of view, what networking needs to do is um, you would now have to define something called a service. And that service gives an identity to your pod. So remember, in a stateless application, a pod can come, can get deployed, can um, scale up, scale down, may even get killed uh, based on priorities or what uh, scheduler decision. So how does your other components addressing your service need a stable identity and that's what the service uh, does. It gives us a name or an IP address which is stable. You can also define a network policy and think of a network policy as kind of a set of routing rules, right, for ingress and egress to say who can talk to who within your application. That's what you would do through a network policy. And finally, ingress is what you would use to manage traffic coming into your application. So you, you kind of had to put all of this together to, to get your application view. And then you wanna think about if you wanna configure storage, and we talked about the constructs there. So either through volumes, persistent volume claims, uh, or even using stateful sets and persistent volume templates, you can get storage into your app if you need to. Or you can you know, just use local file systems which are um, ephemeral and will kind of disappear when your container dies if you don't need persistent storage. So let's kind of look at you know, what now in Nirmata, how this would look like from an application developer perspective. 
and what they would do in terms of you know um, being able to m define and manage these manifests, right? So the first thing here, so remember I mentioned that to a developer, the pod is perhaps the most important thing. And if you kind of think about that or relate that with something like Docker Compose, this is what you know, the basics of what you would define in a container, right? Um, but now, let's say I want to deploy that pod into, an, uh, into some environment, production or dev test or staging. So that's where I need to you know, surround that pod with the right stateful set or deployment. I then want to define a service for it to give it that external identity. I want to define my network policies for it to be able to say which other components in my application can address and talk to that pod, um, and also who I can talk to. I want to then define if I have uh, external load balancing rules. So if my service is public facing and takes uh, traffic from the outside, I can define ingress for it. And then to complete my application, you might have other configuration variables, which you store in things called config maps. You might have secrets, which are uh, sensitive pieces of information like passwords, SSL keys, et cetera. Um, and you would have you know, volumes if you want to supply those to your application. So all of this together is what makes up a Kubernetes application. And what we do, a lot of what we do at Nirmata is we kind of bridge that gap between that developer view, where I want to focus on something simple, my pod, my containers, to what an operator needs to deploy and operate uh, their application in a production type environment, right? And all of these are now, in Nirmata you can specify through policies itself. So let's, let's take a quick look at it. I know we just have a few minutes left and then we'll come back and wrap up. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna define an environment on top of the cluster we, that we just created, right? So I'll call this DevNet Create and we'll select the cluster DevNet Create that we just provisioned before. And I'm gonna specify an isolation policy where I'm gonna namespace each application so I can have multiple work copies of the same application running in my cluster. And once I add that particular um, you know, environment, there's other policies, by the way, I can configure, which we, you know, I don't have time to go into all these right now, but what I wanna just quickly show is we'll do a very simple um, application here, and I'm gonna select one which has about four or five containers, and that application will get deployed in a few seconds now onto the cluster that we created, right? So it, what we'll see is these will start coming up and start going green, much very similar to what we saw in our, in our previous demo uh, when we were looking at uh, you know, what it takes to deploy a container, uh, a, the cluster itself. I can also drill down here and see everything that behind the scenes Nirmata did to deploy that application onto the cluster. So each one of these resources got created. And in fact, if I want to now go and export this, just for kicks, what we'll do is we'll see what this simple application looks like if I export it as YAML, right? So if I just export this as YAML, uh, these are all the manifests underneath that got created for me. Um, and I can show you how this application was modeled in Nirmata. If we go back into our catalog, you can pull in applications through uh, Helm catalog, or you can model them from scratch over here. And the application that we deployed was this one with four different services, and you see it's running in these particular uh, environments. All right, so let's quickly summarize you know, and wrap up. So really, you know, when I started, I mentioned about the, the Puppet Labs, the state of DevOps survey, and the speed that enterprises need now to deliver. And obviously, businesses that can build faster, deliver faster, innovate faster will win. And Kubernetes today has very quickly become, all the excitement behind it is because it's become one of those tools that can help your business get more agile and faster. Um, so from our, you know, the, the view that we see is that enterprises are ab adopting Kubernetes for several reasons, portability, agility, and also the, to get, get greater efficiencies. So there's cost savings also with using something like Kubernetes on cloud providers. 
And more and more, you know, the, the worldview has become that containers are the best way to package applications, and Kubernetes has evolved into the best way to run these applications. And what we kind of do at Nirmata is our focus is on being able to deploy, operate workloads in Kubernetes, and also help manage these clusters. So that's all I had for the presentation, and I see here right uh, you know, at the 45-minute mark. So I'll stick around for questions, but, um, but we'll wrap up the session at this point. Thank you. Thank you.